Come Follow Me reading, February 5th through 11th. Free to choose liberty and eternal life through the great mediator. 2 Nephi chapters 1 through 2. If you knew that your life was coming to an end, what final messages would you want to share with the people you love most? When the prophet Lehi felt he was nearing the end of his life, he gathered his family together one last time. He shared with them what Heavenly Father had revealed to him. He bore his testimony of the Messiah. He taught gospel truths he cherished to the people he cherished. He talked about liberty, obedience, the fall of Adam and Eve, redemption through Jesus Christ, and joy. Not all of his children chose to live by what he taught. None of us can make these choices for our loved ones. But we can teach and testify of the Redeemer, who makes us free to choose liberty and eternal life. Introduction The second book of Nephi begins with Lehi teaching and expressing the desires of his heart to his family. The eloquent and prophetic teachings of this great patriarch, who was soon to die, are evidence of his wisdom and the spirit of the Lord that was with him. The second book of Nephi, an account of the death of Lehi. Nephi's brethren rebel against him. The Lord warns Nephi to depart into the wilderness, his journeyings in the wilderness, and so forth. Chapter 1. Lehi prophecies of a land of liberty. His seed will be scattered and smitten if they reject the Holy One of Israel. He exhorts his sons to put on the armor of righteousness, about 588 through 570 BC. And now it came to pass that after I, Nephi, had made an end of teaching my brethren, our father Lehi also spake many things unto them, and rehearsed unto them how great the things the Lord had done for them in bringing them out of the land of Jerusalem. And he spake unto them concerning the rebellions upon the waters, and the mercies of God in sparing their lives, that they were not swallowed up in the sea. And he also spake unto them concerning the land of promise, which they had obtained, how merciful the Lord had been in warning us that we should flee out of the land of Jerusalem. For behold, said he, I have seen a vision, in which I know that Jerusalem is destroyed. And had we remained in Jerusalem, we should also have perished. Student Manual, 2 Nephi 1, 1 through 1-4, The Dates of Lehi's Journey The destruction of Jerusalem referred to in 2 Nephi 1, 4 is recorded in the Bible in 2 Kings 25. Lehi and his group had been warned by the Lord to flee from the land of Jerusalem so that they would escape this destruction. Most biblical scholars date the destruction of Jerusalem by the Babylonians somewhere between 586 B.C. and 590 B.C. Thus, in his chronological footnotes in this section of the Book of Mormon, Brother James E. Talmadge suggests that the events following Lehi's vision of the destruction of Jerusalem took place sometime after 588 B.C. Scriptures But, said he, notwithstanding our afflictions, we have obtained a land of promise, a land which is choice above all other lands, a land which the Lord God hath covenanted with me should be a land for the inheritance of my seed. Yea, the Lord hath covenanted this land unto me, and to my children forever, and also all those who should be led out of other countries by the hand of the Lord. Wherefore, I, Lehi, prophesy according to the workings of the Spirit which is in me, that there shall none come into this land, save they shall be brought by the hand of the Lord. Wherefore, this land is consecrated unto him whom he shall bring. And if it so be that they shall serve him according to the commandments which he hath given, it shall be a land of liberty unto them. Wherefore, they shall never be brought down into captivity. If so, it shall be because of iniquity. For if iniquity shall abound, cursed shall be the land for their sakes. But unto the righteous it shall be blessed forever. Student Manual, 2 Nephi 1, verses 5-7 through Inhabitants of the Promised Land The Lord in his scripture tells us that no one can come to this land, North and South America, unless he be brought or directed by the Spirit of the Lord. And so he has brought this people here. He brought the faith of the devoted Puritans of New England. He brought the patriotism of the Dutch at New York. He brought the gallantry of the Cavaliers of Virginia, the light-hearted energy of the French of New Orleans. Just the kind of composite body of men to establish a government that could not be dominated by any particular race or tongue, but made composite that all men might be welcome to it live under, and enjoy its privileges. Back to the scriptures. And behold, it is wisdom that this land should be kept as yet from the knowledge of other nations. 
For behold, many nations would overrun the land, that there would be no place for an inheritance. Wherefore I, Lehi, have obtained a promise, that inasmuch as those whom the Lord God shall bring out of the land of Jerusalem shall keep his commandments, they shall prosper upon the face of this land, and they shall be kept from all other nations, that they may possess this land unto themselves. And if it so be that they shall keep his commandments, they shall be blessed upon the face of this land, and there shall be none to molest them, nor to take away the land of their inheritance, and they shall dwell safely forever. But behold, when the time cometh that they shall dwindle in unbelief, after they have received so great blessings from the hand of the Lord, having a knowledge of the creation of the earth and all men, knowing the great and marvelous works of the Lord from the creation of the world, having power given them to do all things by faith, having all the commandments from the beginning, and having been brought by his infinite goodness into this precious land of promise. Behold, I say, if the day shall come that they will reject the Holy One of Israel, the true Messiah, their Redeemer, and their God, behold, the judgments of him that is just shall rest upon them. Yea, and he will bring other nations unto them, and he will give unto them power, and he will take away from them the lands of their possessions, and he will cause them to be scattered and smitten. Student Manual, 2 Nephi 1, verses 5-11 through 11, A Land of Liberty President Ezra Taft Benson testified that America is a land of liberty set apart for the restoration of the gospel. Our Father in Heaven planned the coming forth of the Founding Fathers and their form of government as the necessary great prologue leading to the restoration of the gospel. Recall what our Savior Jesus Christ said nearly 2,000 years ago when he visited this promised land. For it is wisdom in the Father that they should be established in this land, and be set up as a free people by the power of the Father, that these things might come forth. America, the land of liberty, was to be the Lord's latter-day base of operations for his restored church. Elder Eduardo Ayala of the Seventy explained that the blessings of the gospel are now available wherever faithful members live. The conditions of peoples and of nations change due to progress in the world. Nevertheless, in many such places, be it in the frosty mountain heights, in the warm valleys, at the river's edges, or in the desert places, wherever members of the church are found, there will always be those who live these basic principles, and by so doing they bless the rest of the people. Scriptures Yea, as one generation passeth to another, there shall be bloodsheds, and great visitations among them. Wherefore, my sons, I would that ye would remember, yea, I would that ye would hearken unto my words. O oh, that ye would awake, awake from a deep sleep, yea, even from the sleep of hell, and shake off the awful chains by which ye are bound, which are the chains which bind the children of men, that they are carried away captive down to the eternal gulf of misery and woe. Awake, and arise from the dust, and hear the words of a trembling parent, whose limbs ye must soon lay down in the cold and silent grave from whence no traveler can return. A few more days, and I go the way of all the earth. Student Manual, 2 Nephi 1, verse 13 and 14. From whence no traveler can return. Anti-Mormon critics claim that Joseph Smith received from Shakespeare the idea of referring to death as the cold and silent grave from whence no traveler can return. Shakespeare's quotation, which critics say is too similar to the statement by Lehi, reads as follows. But that the dread of something after death, the undiscovered country from whose born no traveler returns, from Hamlet. Such critics overlook other possibilities for the explanation of the similarity between this statement by Joseph Smith and the one by Shakespeare. In the first place, the idea of referring to death in such a manner is not unique to either of these men. In the book of Job in the Old Testament, we find statements as, Before I go, whence I shall not return even to the land of darkness and the shadow of death. And, when a few years are come, then I shall go the way whence I shall not return. Also, the Roman poet Catullus, who lived in the first century BC, included a similar thought in his Elegy on a Sparrow, now having passed the gloomy bourne from whence he never can return. To the Scriptures But behold, the Lord hath redeemed my soul from hell. I have beheld his glory and I am encircled about eternally in the arms of his love. And I desire that ye should remember to observe the statutes and the judgments of the Lord. Behold, this hath been the anxiety of my soul from the beginning. 
My heart hath been weighed down with sorrow from time to time, for I have feared, lest for the hardness of your hearts the Lord your God should come out in the fullness of his wrath upon you, that ye be cut off and destroyed forever, or that a cursing should come upon you for the space of many generations, and ye are visited by sword and by famine, and are hated, and are led according to the will and captivity of the devil. O my sons, that these things might not come upon you, but that ye might be a choice and a favored people of the Lord. But behold, his will be done, for his ways are righteousness forever. And he hath said that inasmuch as ye shall keep my commandments, ye shall prosper in the land. But inasmuch as ye will not keep my commandments, ye shall be cut off from my presence. Student Manual, 2 Nephi 1, verses 15 through 20. Prophetic Promise for the Obedient A look at the cross-references for 2 Nephi 1.20 reveals many other Book of Mormon references wherein the promise is repeated that those who keep the Lord's commandments will prosper in the land. This appears to have been one of those prophetic utterances that was preserved in the hearts and the writings of the people from generation to generation. It is a promise that is still in force for the promised land, present-day North and South America. Those who are obedient will prosper both spiritually and temporally in the land. Come follow me, Manuel, 2 Nephi 1.20. I am blessed when I obey God's commandments. Would it help your children to compare God's commandments to shoes, hats, gloves, or other things that protect us? Maybe you could let them try on some as you talk about how the commandments protect us. Then you could read 2 Nephi 1.20, emphasizing that we prosper, are blessed, or protected as we keep the commandments. Share an experience when you were blessed or protected by following the commandments. To illustrate the difference between prospering and being cut off from God, you and your children could look at a healthy plant and a leaf or branch that has been cut off from the plant. Then your children could review choices that Nephi and his brothers made. What were the results of these choices? What choices help us stay connected to God? scriptures, and now that my soul might have joy in you, and that my heart might leave this world with gladness because of you, that I might not be brought down with grief and sorrow to the grave. Arise from the dust, my sons, and be men, and be determined in one mind and in one heart, united in all things, that ye may not come down into captivity, that ye may not be cursed with a sore cursing, and also that ye may not incur the displeasure of a just God upon you, unto the destruction, yea, the eternal destruction of both soul and body. Student Manual, 2 Nephi 1, 22, Eternal Destruction Verse 22 in 2 Nephi chapter 1 does not mean that the spirit and the body of the wicked will be annihilated or become extinct. Our spirits are eternal in nature, and all people born on earth will have a physical resurrection. President Joseph Fielding Smith explained the meaning of the destruction of the soul as Nephi used it. Destruction does not mean annihilation. We know, because we are taught in the revelations of the Lord, that a soul cannot be destroyed. Every soul born into this world shall receive the resurrection and immortality and shall endure forever. Destruction does not mean, then, annihilation. When the Lord says they shall be destroyed, he means that they shall be banished from his presence that they shall be cut off from the presence of light and truth, and shall not have the privilege of gaining this exaltation, and that is destruction. Wickedness destroys the opportunity for a resurrection into a higher degree of glory. Scriptures, Awake, my sons, put on the armor of righteousness. Shake off the chains with which ye are bound, and come forth out of obscurity, and arise from the dust. Student Manual, 2 Nephi 1, verses 13-23 Awake from the sleep of hell. Disobedience to the Lord's commandments allows Satan to deceive us, and we forget the light and truth we have pers- previously learned. President Henry B. Eyring of the First Presidency described this dangerous condition. One of the effects of disobeying God seems to be the creation of just enough spiritual anesthetic to block any sensation as the ties to God are being cut. Not only does the testimony of the truth slowly erode, but even the memories of what it was like to be in the light begin to seem like a delusion. Come follow me, 2 Nephi 1, 13, 15, and 23. Jesus Christ helps me overcome the effects of sin. To help your children understand Lehi's invitation to shake off the chains of sin, 
Maybe you could work together to make a chain from slips of paper. On the slips, your children could help you write some things Satan tempts us to do. Then you could read together 2 Nephi 1, 13, 15, and 23, as they act out some of the phrases in these verses, including shaking off the paper chain. How is sin like a chain? How does Jesus help us shake off the chains of sin? To the scriptures. Rebel no more against your brother, whose views have been glorious, and who hath kept the commandments from the time that we left Jerusalem, and who hath been an instrument in the hands of God, and bringing us forth into the land of promise. For were it not for him, we must have perished with hunger in the wilderness. Nevertheless, ye sought to take away his life. Yea, and he hath suffered much sorrow because of you. And I exceedingly fear and tremble because of you, lest he shall suffer again. For behold, ye have accused him that he sought power and authority over you. But I know that he hath not sought for power nor authority over you, but he hath sought the glory of God and your own eternal welfare. And ye have murmured because he hath been plain unto you. Ye say that he hath used sharpness. Ye say that he hath been angry with you. But behold, his sharpness was the sharpness of the power of the word of God, which was in him. And that which ye call anger was the truth, according to that which is in God, which he could not restrain, manifesting boldly concerning your iniquities. And it must needs be that the power of God must be with him, even unto his commanding you that ye must obey. But behold, it was not he, but it was the Spirit of the Lord which was in him, which opened his mouth to utterance that he could not shut it. And now my son, Laman, and also Lemuel and Sam, and also my sons who are the sons of Ishmael, Behold, if ye will hearken unto the voice of Nephi, ye shall not perish. And if ye will hearken unto him, I leave unto you a blessing, yea, even my first blessing. But if ye will not hearken unto him, I take away my first blessing, yea, even my blessing, and it shall rest upon him. Come follow me, 2 Nephi 1, 13-29. I can awake and arise from the dust. In 2 Nephi chapter 1, verses 13-29, Notice the words Lehi used to describe the spiritual condition of Laman and Lemuel. What helps you awaken from a spiritual deep sleep? What helps you shake off the spiritual chains in your life? Think about Lehi's testimony in verse 15 and his invitation in verse 23. What message does Heavenly Father have for you in these verses? Student Manual, 2 Nephi 1, 21-29 The Power of the Devil Lehi made frequent reference to the power of the devil in his final blessing to Laman and Lemuel. Laman and Lemuel's behavior indicates that Satan had a great hold over them. To say that they were bound with chains is an apt description of their awful plight. Nephi warned the saints of the latter days in similar terms. Scriptures And now, Zoram, I speak unto you. Behold, thou art the servant of Laban. Nevertheless, thou hast been brought out of the land of Jerusalem, and I know that thou art a true friend unto my son Nephi forever. Wherefore, because thou hast been faithful, thy seed shall be blessed with his seed, that they dwell in prosperity long upon the face of this land, and nothing, save it shall be iniquity among them, shall harm or disturb their prosperity upon the face of this land forever. Wherefore, if ye shall keep the commandments of the Lord, the Lord hath consecrated this land for the security of thy seed with the seed of my son. Chapter 2 Redemption comes through the Holy Messiah. Freedom of choice, agency, is essential to existence and progression. Adam fell that men might be. Men are free to choose liberty and eternal life. About 588 through 570 BC. And now, Jacob, I speak unto you. Thou art my firstborn in the days of my tribulation in the wilderness. And behold, in thy childhood thou hast suffered afflictions and much sorrow, because of the rudeness of thy brethren. Nevertheless, Jacob, my firstborn in the wilderness, thou knowest the greatness of God, and he shall consecrate thy afflictions for thy gain. Student Manual, 2 Nephi 2, verses 1 through 2. Great Blessings from Difficulties. President Spencer W. Kimball said, We knew before we were born that we were coming to the earth for bodies and experience, and that we would have joys and sorrows, ease and pain, comforts and hardships, health and sickness, successes and disappointments, and we knew also that after a period of life we would die. 
we accepted all these eventualities with a glad heart, eager to accept both the favorable and unfavorable. We eagerly accepted the chance to come earthward, even though it might be only for a day or a year. Perhaps we were not so much concerned whether we should die of disease, of accident, or of senility. We were willing to take life as it came, and as we might organize and control it, and this without murmur, complaint, or unreasonable demands. Elder Marion G. Romney taught the following about difficulties and afflictions. If we can bear our afflictions with the understanding, faith, and courage, we shall be strengthened and comforted in many ways. We shall be spared the torment which accompanies the mistaken idea that all suffering comes as chastisement for transgression. I have seen the remorse and despair in the lives of men who, in the hour of trial, have cursed God and died spiritually. And I have seen people rise to great heights from what seem to be unbearable burdens. President Howard W. Hunter also testified, At various times in our lives, probably at repeated times in our lives, we do have to acknowledge that God knows what we do not know and sees what we do not see. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, saith the Lord. If you have troubles at home with children who stray, if you suffer financial reverses and emotional strain that threaten your homes and your happiness, if you must face the loss of life or health, may peace be unto your soul. We will not be tempted upon our ability to withstand. Our detours and disappointments are the straight and narrow path to him, as we sing in one of our favorite hymns. When through fiery trials thy pathway shall lie, my grace, all sufficient, shall be thy supply. The flame shall not hurt thee, I only design thy dross to consume and thy gold to refine. Second Nephi 2.2 2. Consecrate Afflictions for Gain In Second Nephi chapter 2, verse 2, Lehi stated that the trials we endure can turn to our benefit. Elder Dallin H. Oaks of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles explained how a sense of gratitude enables us to see our hardships in the context of our purpose here on earth. When we give thanks in all things, we see hardships and adversities in the context of the purpose of life. We are sent here to be tested. There must be opposition in all things. We are meant to learn and grow through that opposition, through meeting our challenges, and through teaching others to do the same. Elder Richard G. Scott of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles explained that God provides us with challenges that are designed to help us grow spiritually. Just when all seems to be going right, challenges often come in multiple doses applied simultaneously. When those trials are not consequences of your disobedience, they are evidence that the Lord feels you are prepared to grow more. He therefore gives you experiences that stimulate growth, understanding, and compassion, which polish you for your everlasting benefit. To get you from where you are to where he wants you to be requires a lot of stretching, and that generally entails discomfort and pain. To the scriptures, Wherefore thy soul shall be blessed, and thou shalt dwell safely with thy brother Nephi, and thy days shall be spent in the service of thy God. Wherefore I know that thou art redeemed because of the righteousness of thy Redeemer. For thou hast beheld that in the fullness of time he cometh to bring salvation unto men. And thou hast beheld in thy youth his glory. Wherefore, thou art blessed even as they unto whom he shall minister in the flesh. For the Spirit is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And the way is prepared from the fall of man, and salvation is free. Student Manual, 2 Nephi 2, verse 4. Salvation is free. Salvation means to be saved from both physical and spiritual death. All people will be saved from physical death by the grace of God, through the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Each individual can also be saved from spiritual death as well by the grace of God through faith in Jesus Christ. This faith is manifested in a life of obedience to the laws and ordinances of the gospel and service to Christ. Through the atonement of Jesus Christ, the plan of salvation is freely available to everyone. This does not mean that all men and women will receive the same reward. As Alma testified, Whosoever will come may come and partake of the waters of life freely. But he added this warning, Whosoever will not come, the same is not compelled to come. But in the last day it shall be restored unto him according to his deeds. 
Salvation is free in the sense that it is provided by the grace of God through the atonement of Christ for all who will receive it. It is not free in the sense that it is given to all regardless of what they believe or how they choose to live their lives. Scriptures And men are instructed sufficiently that they know good from evil, and the law is given unto men, and by the law no flesh is justified, or by the law men are cut off. Yea, by the temporal law they were cut off, and also by the spiritual law they perish from that which is good, and become miserable forever. Wherefore redemption cometh in and through the holy Messiah, for he is full of grace and truth. Student Manual, 2 Nephi, chapter 2, verses 5 and 6. By the law no flesh is justified. Justification means to be pardoned from punishment for sin, and declared guiltless. A person is justified by the Savior's grace through faith in Him. This faith is shown by repentance and obedience to the laws and ordinances of the gospel. Jesus Christ's atonement enables mankind to repent and be justified or pardoned from punishment they otherwise would receive. Elder Dallin H. Oaks instructed us that the Book of Mormon teaches that salvation does not come by keeping the commandments alone. By the law, no flesh is justified. Even those who serve God with their whole souls are unprofitable servants. Man cannot earn his own salvation. The Book of Mormon teaches, since man had fallen, he could not merit anything of himself. There can be nothing which is short of an infinite atonement which will suffice for the sins of the world. Wherefore, redemption cometh in and through the Holy Messiah. He offereth himself a sacrifice for sin to answer the ends of the law. And so we preach of Christ that our children may know to what source they may look for remission of their sins. Scriptures. Behold, he offereth himself a sacrifice for sin to answer the ends of the law unto all those who have a broken heart and a contrite spirit, and unto none else can the laws, ends of the law be answered. Student Manual, 2 Nephi 2, verses 3-7 through 7, Redeemed by Righteousness of the Savior Lehi's message in 2 Nephi 2, 3-7 through 7, pertains to redemption, the means whereby the Savior brought salvation unto man. Lehi said that salvation is free. In what sense is this true? We believe that through the sufferings, death, and atonement of Jesus Christ, all mankind, without one exception, are to be completely and fully redeemed both body and spirit, from the endless banishment and curse to which they were consigned by Adam's transgression, and that this universal salvation and redemption of the whole human family from the endless penalty of the original sin is effected without any conditions whatever on their part. That is, they are not required to believe or repent or be baptized or do anything else in order to be redeemed from that penalty. For whether they believe or disbelieve, whether they repent or remain impenitent, Whether they are baptized or unbaptized, whether they keep the commandments or break them, whether they are righteous or unrighteous, it will make no difference in relation to their redemption, both soul and body, from the penalty of Adam's transgression. The most righteous man that ever lived on the earth, and the most wicked wretch of the whole human family, were both placed under the same curse, without any transgression or agency of their own, and they both alike will be redeemed from that curse, without any agency or conditions on their part. Lehi told Jacob that he was redeemed because of the righteousness of thy Redeemer, not for any act of Jacob's, but because of Jesus Christ. Lehi said, The way is prepared from the fall of man, and salvation is free. There is another way in which redemption comes to man. Men are instructed sufficiently that they know good from evil, yet all men sin. Hence it is that by the law no flesh is justified. To be justified means to stand uncondemned before the Lord. No man has ever done that by his own merits, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. No man keeps the law of God in perfection. Thus it is that Christ offereth himself a sacrifice for sin to answer the ends of the law. Jesus stood in our place and received the punishment due for all the broken laws of God in all the ages. But this aspect of salvation is not free in the strictest sense of the word, for there are things men must do to claim the benefits of salvation. Lehi says that salvation has value only for those who have a broken heart and a contrite spirit, and unto none else can the ends of the law be answered. Men who would claim the benefits of Christ's atoning act 
must exhibit faith in him sufficient to repent of all their sins. There is no other way to receive the full benefits of this redemptive act. Elder James E. Talmadge said, The individual effect of the atonement makes it possible for any and every soul to obtain absolution from the effect of personal sins through the mediation of Christ. But such having intercession is to be invoked by individual effort as manifested through faith, repentance, and continued works of righteousness. The laws under which individual salvation is obtainable have been prescribed by Christ, whose right it is to say how the blessings made possible by his own sacrifice shall be administered. All men are in need of the Savior's mediation, for all are transgressors. That the blessing of redemption from individual sins, while open for all to attain, is nevertheless conditioned on individual effort, is as plainly declared as is the truth of unconditional redemption from death as an effect of the fall. There is a judgment ordained for all, and all will be judged according to their works. The free agency of man enables him to choose or reject to follow the path of life or the road that leads to destruction. Therefore, it is but just that he be held to answer for the exercise of his power of choice, and that he meet the results of his acts. Scriptures. Wherefore, how great the importance to make these things known unto the inhabitants of the earth, that they may know that there is no flesh that can dwell in the presence of God, save it be through the merits and mercy and grace of the Holy Messiah, who layeth down his life according to the flesh, and taketh it again by the power of the Spirit, that he may bring to pass the resurrection of the dead, being the first that should rise. Student Manual, 2 Nephi 2, 8 The Merits and Mercy and Grace of the Holy Messiah Prior to his call to the Quorum of the Seventy, Elder Bruce C. Hafen explained that the atonement is not simply God's method for righting wrongs and satisfying the demands of justice. The atonement is rehabilitative, a miraculous power that can help us change who we are. I once wondered if those who refuse to repent, but who then satisfy the law of justice by paying for their own sins, are then worthy to enter the celestial kingdom. The answer is no. The entrance requirements for celestial life are simply higher than merely satisfying the law of justice. For that reason, paying for our own sins will not bear the same fruit as repenting of our sins. Justice is a law of balance and order, and it must be satisfied either through our payment or his. But if we decline the Savior's invitation to let him carry our sins and then satisfy justice by ourselves, we will not yet have experienced the complete rehabilitation that can occur through a combination of divine assistance and genuine repentance. Working together, those forces have the power permanently to change our hearts and our lives, preparing us for celestial life. Elder Richard G. Scott shared his feelings about Christ's mercy in paying our debts. Jesus Christ possessed merits that no other child of Heavenly Father could possibly have. He was a God, Jehovah, before his birth in Bethlehem. His Father not only gave him his spirit body, but Jesus was his only begotten Son in the flesh. Our Master lived a perfect, sinless life, and therefore was free from the demands of justice. He was and is perfect in every attribute including love, compassion, patience, obedience, forgiveness, and humility. His mercy pays our debt to justice when we repent and obey him. Scriptures. Wherefore, he is the first fruits unto God, inasmuch as he shall make intercession for the children, all the children of men, and they that believe in him shall be saved. And because of the intercession for all, all men come unto God. Wherefore, they stand in the presence of him, to be judged of him according to the truth and holiness which is in him. Wherefore, the ends of the law which the Holy One hath given, unto the inflicting of the punishment which is affixed, which punishment that is affixed is in opposition to that of the happiness which is affixed, to answer the ends of the atonement. For it must needs be that there is an opposition in all things. If not so, my firstborn in the wilderness, righteousness cannot be brought to pass, neither wickedness, neither holiness nor misery, neither good nor bad. Wherefore, all things must needs be a compound in one. Wherefore, if it should be one body, it must needs remain as dead, having no life, neither death, nor corruption, nor incorruption, happiness, nor misery, neither sense, nor insensibility. Wherefore, it must needs have been created for a thing of naught. Wherefore, there would have been no purpose in the end of its creation. 
Wherefore, this thing must needs destroy the wisdom of God and his eternal purposes, and also the power and the mercy and the justice of God. And if ye shall say there is no law, ye shall also say there is no sin. If ye shall say there is no sin, ye shall also say there is no righteousness. And if there be no righteousness, there be no happiness. And if there be no righteousness nor happiness, there be no punishment nor misery. And if these things are not, there is no God. And if there is no God, we are not, neither the earth, for there could have been no creation of things, neither to act nor to be acted upon. Wherefore, all things must have vanished away. And now, my sons, I speak unto you these things for your profit and learning. For there is a God, and he hath created all things, both the heavens and the earth, and all things that in them are, both things to act and things to be acted upon. Student Manual, 2 Nephi, chapter 2, verses 11 through 14. There is an opposition in all things. President Boyd K. Packer, president of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles, explained that opposition helps us grow stronger. Life will not be free from challenges, some of them bitter and hard to bear. We may wish to be spared all the trials of life, but that would be contrary to the great plan of happiness, for it must needs be that there is an opposition in all things. This testing is the source of our strength. President Ezra Taft Benson explained that opposition provides choice. The Book of Mormon teaches that it must needs be that there is an opposition in all things, and so there is. Opposition provides choices, and choices bring consequences, good or bad. The Book of Mormon explains that men are free to choose liberty and eternal life through the great mediator of all men, or to choose captivity and death according to the captivity and power of the devil. God loves us, the devil hates us. God wants us to have a fullness of joy as he has. The devil wants us to be miserable as he is. God gives us commandments to bless us. The devil would have us break these commandments to curse us. Daily, constantly, we choose by our desires, our thoughts, and our actions whether we want to be blessed or cursed, happy or miserable. Elder Neil A. Maxwell of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles commented on how opposition relates to happiness. Indeed, without the existence of choices, without our freedom to choose, and without opposition, there would be no real existence. This is so much like Lehi's metaphor of how, in the absence of agency and opposites, things would have resulted in a meaningless, undifferentiated compound in one. In such a situation, the earth would actually have no purpose in the end of its creation. It is a fact that we can neither grow spiritually nor thereby be truly happy unless and until we make wise use of our moral agency. Scriptures, and to bring about his eternal purposes in the end of man, after he had created our first parents, and the beasts of the field, and the fowls of the air, and in fine, all things which are created, it must needs be that there was an opposition, even the forbidden fruit in opposition to the tree of life, the one being sweet and the other bitter. Student Manual, 2 Nephi 2, verse 15. The Tree of Knowledge of Good and Evil and the Tree of Life Elder Bruce R. McConkie of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles explained the meaning of the Tree of Life and the Tree of Knowledge of Good and Evil. As to the fall, the scripture set forth that there were in the Garden of Eden two trees. One was the Tree of Life, which figuratively refers to eternal life. The other was the Tree of Knowledge of Good and Evil, which figuratively refers to how and why and in what manner mortality and all that appertains to it came into being. 2 Nephi 2.15 What was forbidden? President Joseph Fielding Smith showed how the Book of Moses helps us understand why the Lord commanded Adam to not partake of the fruit. Just why the Lord would say to Adam that he forbade him to partake of the fruit of that tree is not made clear in the Bible account. But in the original, it, as it comes to us in the Book of Moses, it is made definitely clear. It is that the Lord said to Adam that if he wished to remain as he was in the garden, that he was not to eat the fruit, but if he desired to eat it and partake of death, he was at liberty to do so. Scriptures. Wherefore the Lord gave unto man that he should act for himself. Wherefore man could not act for himself, save it should be that he was enticed by the one or the other. Student Manual, 2 Nephi 2, verses 11 through 16. Plan of Growth and Progress. The purpose served by opposition in all things is that man might be tested to see if he will choose the good or the evil. 
He who desires good will do good, while he who desires evil will do evil. Evil is with us. It is that influence which tempts to sin and which has been permitted to come into the world for the express purpose of giving us an opportunity of proving ourselves before God, before Jesus Christ, our elder brother, before the holy angels, and before all good men, that we are determined to overcome the evil and cleave to the good, for the Lord has given us the ability to do so. Man is on earth under a plan provided by God, the father of the spirits of men. This plan is for the good and welfare of man. The ultimate purpose of the plan is to enable every person to develop his every power, and thus to progress eternally. Embedded in every part of the plan is the right of every man to act for himself, to choose one or the other of the opposites which present themselves before him. If he chooses to, th- to do that which is for his welfare, which enables him to progress, he chooses the good. If he chooses that which retards his progress, he chooses the evil. Whatever conforms to the plan of God for his earth children is good. Whatever is in opposition to the plan is evil. That is a simple, plain definition of evil. Scriptures, and I, Lehi, according to the things which I have read, must needs suppose that an angel of God, according to that which is written, had fallen from heaven. Wherefore he became a devil, having sought that that which was evil before God. And because he had fallen from heaven and had become miserable forever, he sought also the misery of all mankind. Wherefore he said unto Eve, Yea, even that old serpent, who is the devil, who is the father of all lies, wherefore he said, Partake of the forbidden fruit, and ye shall not die, but ye shall be as God, knowing good and evil. Student Manual, 2 Nephi 2, 17-18 An angel of God became a devil. President James E. Faust of the First Presidency explained how Lucifer fell from his position of authority. Because of his rebellion, Lucifer was cast out and became Satan, the devil, the father of all lies, to deceive and to blind men, and to lead them captive at his will, even as many as would not hearken unto my voice. And so this personage, who was an angel of God and in authority, even in the presence of God, was removed from the presence of God and his Son. This caused great sadness in the heavens, for the heavens wept over him. He was Lucifer, a son of the morning. Scriptures. And after Adam and Eve had partaken of the forbidden fruit, they were driven out of the garden of Eden to till the earth. And they have brought forth children, yea, even the family of all the earth. And the days of the children of men were prolonged according to the will of God, that they might repent while in the flesh. Wherefore, their state became a state of probation and their time was lengthened, according to the commandments which the Lord God gave unto the children of men. For he gave commandment that all men must repent, for he showed unto all men that they were lost because of the transgression of their parents. And now, behold, if Adam had not transgressed, he would not have fallen, but he would have remained in the garden of Eden. And all things which were created must have remained in the same state in which they were after they were created, and they must have remained forever and had no end. Student Manual, 2 Nephi 2.22, No Death Before the Fall. In the book of Genesis, we are told that Adam obtained his body from the dust of the earth, and that he was not subject to death is inferred in the commandment the Lord gave him, that if he transgressed the divine commandment and ate the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, he should surely die. In the Book of Mormon, we are positively informed that Adam would have lived forever in the garden if he had not partaken of the forbidden fruit. So Adam was in no sense mortal until after his transgression. That his immortal spirit came from another world is verily true, just as it is true of each one of us, for we all lived in the spirit existence before we came into this world and obtained bodies which inherited mortality through the fall of Adam. 2 Nephi 2.22 all things were affected by the fall of Adam. Elder Bruce R. McConkie explained how all things were connected to the fall of Adam. Then comes the fall, Adam falls, mortality and procreation and death commence. Fallen man is mortal, he has mortal flesh. He is the first flesh upon the earth. And the effects of his fall pass upon all created things. They fall in that they too become mortal. Death enters the world, mortality reigns, Procreation commences, and the Lord's great and eternal purposes roll onward. Mortality and procreation and death all had their beginnings with the fall. 
an infinite creator in the primeval day, made the earth and man and all forms of life in such a state that they could fall. This fall involved a change of status. All things were so created that they could fall or change. In the primeval and Edenic day, all forms of life lived in a higher state than now prevails. Death and procreation had yet to enter the world. Scriptures, and they would have had no children, wherefore they would have remained in a state of innocence, having no joy, for they knew no misery, doing no good, for they knew no sin. Student Manual, 2 Nephi 2, verses 22 and 23. What is the difference between sin and transgression? Elder Dallin H. Oaks explained the difference between sin and transgression. The contrast between a sin and a transgression reminds us of the careful wording in the second article of faith. We believe that men will be punished for their own sins and not for Adam's transgression. It also echoes a familiar distinction in the law. Some acts, like murder, are crimes because they are inherently wrong. Other acts, like operating without a license, are crimes only because they are legally prohibited. Under these distinctions, the act that produced the fall was not a sin, inherently wrong, but a transgression, wrong because it was formally prohibited. These words are not always used to denote something different, but this distinction seems meaningful in the circumstances of the fall. Scriptures, but behold, all things have been done in the wisdom of him who knoweth all things. Adam fell that men might be, and men are that they might have joy. Come follow me, 2 Nephi 2, 1 through 4, 6 through 25. God can turn my trials into blessings. Lehi knew that his young son Jacob had suffered afflictions and much sorrow during his childhood. Why do you think Lehi's testimony would have been valuable to Jacob? Why is it valuable to you? Look for words and phrases that you find especially powerful. How has God consecrated your afflictions for your gain? 2 Nephi 2.22-25 The Fall and God's Eternal Plan If Adam and Eve had remained in innocence in the Garden of Eden, they would have had no children. Also, they would not have experienced opposition as we know it, for there was no such condition in the idyllic state of the Garden of Eden. It was the divine plan from the very beginning that man should be placed on the earth and be subject to mortal conditions and pass through a probationary state as explained in the Book of Mormon, where he and his posterity would be subject to all mortal conditions. It was part of the divine plan that man should have this period of mortality where he would be shut out of the presence of God and be subject to all the vicissitudes of mortality, the temptations and trials of the flesh, thus gaining experience and being placed in a position of trial, temptation, and be purified by passing through the trials and tribulations of the flesh or mortality, as Paul had described it. This life is a very brief part of our existence, but is the most critical, for it is in mortality where we are tried and figuratively placed in the fire and tested, proved to see what kind of material we are made of, whether we will be worthy of an exaltation in the kingdom of God, or be assigned to some other kingdom. Second Nephi 2, 22-25 Adam fell that men might be. Elder Russell M. Nelson of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles explained why the fall was necessary. The creation culminated with Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. They were created in the image of God with bodies of flesh and bone. Created in the image of God and not yet mortal, they could not grow old and die. And they would have had no children nor experienced the trials of life. The creation of Adam and Eve was a paradisiacal creation one that required a significant change before they could fulfill the commandment to have children, and thus provide earthly bodies for premortal spirit sons and daughters of God. The fall of Adam and Eve constituted the mortal creation and brought about the required change in their bodies, including the circulation of blood and other modifications as well. They were now able to have children. They and their posterity also became subject to injury, disease, and death. President James E. Faust added to the description of how the fall affected Adam and Eve as well as all their posterity. Because of their transgression, Adam and Eve, having chosen to leave their state of innocence, were banished from the presence of God. This is referred to in Christendom as the fall, or Adam's transgression. It is a spiritual death because Adam and Eve were separated from the presence of God and given agency to act for themselves and not to be acted upon. 
they were also given the great power of procreation so that they could keep the commandment to multiply and replenish the earth and have joy in their posterity. All of their posterity were likewise banished from the presence of God. However, the posterity of Adam and Eve were innocent of the original sin because they had no part in it. It was therefore unfair for all of humanity to suffer eternally for the transgressions of our first parents, Adam and Eve. It became necessary to settle this injustice, hence the need for the atoning sacrifice of Jesus in his role as the Savior and Redeemer. Because of the transcendent act of the atonement, it is possible for every soul to obtain forgiveness of sins, to have them washed away and be forgotten. This forgiveness comes about, however, on condition of repentance and personal righteousness. President Brigham Young and President Joseph Fielding Smith help us understand that the fall of Adam was part of our Heavenly Father's plan. Did they, Adam and Eve, come out of, in direct opposition to God and to his government? No, but they transgressed a command of the Lord, and through that transgression sin came into the world. The Lord knew they would do this, and he had designed that they should. Adam did only what he had to do. He partook of the fruit for one good reason— and that was to open the door to bring you and me and everyone else into this world. If it hadn't been for Adam, I wouldn't be here, you wouldn't be here. We would be waiting in the heavens as spirits. We learn from Moses 5, 10, and 11 that Adam and Eve also recognized blessings from the results of the fall. They understood the following concepts. My eyes are opened. They knew good from evil. In the flesh I shall see God. The resurrection could take place from the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. We should have seed. Procreation came into the world. We have known good and evil. Adam and Eve had the agency to choose between good and evil. We have known the joy of our redemption and the eternal life which God giveth unto all the obedient. The atonement could take place. To the scriptures. And the Messiah cometh in the fullness of time that he may redeem the children of men from the fall. And because that they are redeemed from the fall, they have become free forever, knowing good from evil, to act for themselves and not to be acted upon, save it be by the punishment of the law at the great and last day, according to the commandments which God hath given. Wherefore, men are free according to the flesh, and all things are given them which are expedient unto men, and they are free to choose liberty and eternal life through the great mediator of all men, or to choose captivity and death, according to the captivity and power of the devil. For he seeketh that all men might be miserable, like unto himself. Student Manual, 2 Nephi 2, 26 and 27. Free according to the flesh. Men may choose the right, or they may choose the wrong. They may walk in darkness, or they may walk in the light. The Lord has given them, in the various dispensations of the world, the light of the gospel, wherein they could walk and not stumble wherein they could find that peace and happiness which he desires, as a loving father, his children should enjoy, but the Lord does not take from them their free agency. 2 Nephi 2, 15 through 16, 26 and 27. Man should act for himself. President Howard W. Hunter taught that agency is necessary for us to grow. Our Father in heaven wanted our growth to continue in mortality and to be enhanced by our freedom to choose and learn. He also wanted us to exercise our faith and our will, especially with a new physical body to master and control. But we know from both ancient and modern revelation that Satan wished to deny us our independence and agency in that now forgotten moment long ago, even as he wishes to deny them this very hour. Indeed, Satan violently opposed the freedom of choice offered by the Father, so violently that John in the Revelation described war in heaven over the matter. Satan would have coerced us, and he would have robbed us of that most precious of gifts if he could, our freedom to choose a divine future and the exaltation we all hope to obtain. Through Christ and his valiant defense of our Father's plan, the course of agency and eternal aspirations prevailed. So we came to our mortality like Jeremiah, known by God as his literal spirit children, having the privilege to choose our personal path on matters of belief and religious conviction. With Christ's triumph in heaven in overcoming Lucifer, and his late, later his triumph on earth in overcoming the effects of Adam's fall and the death of all mankind, the children of men continue free forever, knowing good from evil, 
to act for themselves and not be acted upon. To fully understand this gift of agency and its inestimable worth, it is imperative that we understand that God's chief way of acting is by persuasion and patience and long-suffering, not by coercion and stark confrontation. He acts by gentle solicitation and by sweet enticement. He always acts with unfailing respect for the freedom and independence that we possess. He wants to help us and pleads for the chance to assist us, but he will not do so in violation of our agency. He loves us too much to do that, and doing so would run counter to his divine character. Come follow me. 2 Nephi 2, 11, 16, and 27. God gave me the freedom to choose. To help your children understand what Lehi taught about opposites and making choices, you could play a game in which you say a word, such as light, and your children say its opposite, dark. Help them learn why opposites are part of God's plan, as you read together 2 Nephi 2, 11, and 16. Then you could share stories about a child who is tempted to make a wrong choice. Your children could share what the opposite of the wrong choice is and act it out. To learn about the difference between liberty and captivity, your children could draw pictures of an animal in a cage and an animal in its natural environment. Which animal is free? Invite the children to point at the correct picture when you read the word free in 2 Nephi 2.27. Testify that Jesus Christ makes us free. Sing a song together like Choose the Right. What do we learn from the song about making choices? Scriptures. And now, my sons, I would that ye should look to the great mediator and hearken unto his great commandments and be faithful unto his words and choose eternal life according to the will of his Holy Spirit and not choose eternal death according to the will of the flesh and the evil which is therein, which giveth the spirit of the devil power to captivate, to bring you down to hell, that he may reign over you in his own kingdom. Come follow me, 2 Nephi 2, 15-29. The fall and the atonement of Jesus Christ are essential parts of Heavenly Father's plan. Many people believe that the fall was only a tragedy and that Eve and Adam made a permanent mistake when they chose to eat the fruit. In 2 Nephi 2, 15-28, Lehi teaches additional truth about the fall and about redemption through Christ. As you search these verses, make a list of truths about what happened in the Garden of Eden. Questions like these could help. Why was the fall necessary? What role did Jesus Christ play in overcoming the effects of the fall? How does correctly understanding the fall help us better understand our need for Jesus Christ? Scriptures I have spoken these few words unto you all, my sons, in the last days of my probation, and I have chosen the good part according to the words of the prophet, and I have none other object save it be the everlasting welfare of your souls. Amen. Student Manual, 2 Nephi 2, 28-30 Power to Captivate Our Souls The prophet Joseph Smith said, The devil has no power over us, only as we permit him. The moment we revolt at anything which comes from God, the devil takes power. 2 Nephi 2, 6-30 Creation, Fall, and Atonement Elder Bruce R. McConkie of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles shared the following insights about the interrelationship between the creation, the fall, and the atonement. It is not possible to believe in Christ and his atoning sacrifice in the true and full sense required to gain salvation, without at the same time believing and accepting the true doctrine of the fall. If there had been no fall, there would have been no need for a Redeemer or Savior. And it is not possible to believe in the fall, out of which immortality and eternal life come, without at the same time believing and accepting the true doctrine of the creation. If there had been no creation of all things in a deathless or immortal state, there could have been no fall, and hence no atonement and no salvation. The Father's eternal plan created, called for the creation, for the fall, and for the atonement, all woven together into one united whole. On another occasion, Elder Bruce R. McConkie explained, The most important events that have ever or will occur in all eternity are the creation, the fall, and the atonement. Before we can even begin to understand the temporal creation of all things, we must know how and in what manner these three eternal verities the creation, the fall, and the atonement are inseparably woven together to form one plan of salvation. No one of them stands alone. 
Each of them ties into the other two, and without a knowledge of all of them, it is not possible to know the truth about any one of them. But, be it remembered, the atonement came because of the fall. Christ paid the ransom for Adam's transgression. If there had been no fall, there would be no atonement with its consequent immortality and eternal life. Thus, just as surely as salvation comes because of the atonement, so also salvation comes because of the fall. Come follow me, 2 Nephi 2. Because of Jesus Christ, I am free to choose liberty and eternal life. Lehi's family was now in a new land full of new possibilities. The choices they made in this new place would be important for their success and happiness. Perhaps this is why Lehi taught his son Jacob about agency or the ability to make choices in 2 Nephi 2. As you study verses 11 through 30, write down possible answers to these questions. Why is agency so important to Heavenly Father, even though some people use it in hurtful ways? How does the adversary try to weaken or destroy your agency? How does the Savior help you choose liberty and eternal life? Here's another way to learn about agency in 2 Nephi 2. Look for things that are essential for us to have agency and to reach our divine potential. For example, 2 Nephi 2, 5, a knowledge of good and evil, a law. What would happen to our agency if one or more of these things were missing? Each of the six sections of For the Strength of Youth, A Guide for Making Choices, contains invitations and promised blessings. Look at one or more of these sections and choose the promised blessing you hope for in your life. What invitation do you need to act on to receive this blessing? Consider sharing with someone the blessings you have received from following these invitations.